Thank you. Hey, what's up? Uh, my name is Shahina. I'm a product lead at LinkedIn, and my talk is about building search and discovery products to find opportunity. Um, quick background. About me first. <laughs> um, I grew up in the former Soviet Union in Tashkent, which is the capital city of Uzbekistan. Um, and if you haven't been to that part of the world, dec definitely recommend checking it out. It's an interesting place. Um, so I got myself out of there when I was 17, moved to the U.S. Um, to study in college, studied computer science, um, and of course the natural step after that was to become an engineer. So I did that for a couple of years and then discovered the wonderful world of product um, and jumped in, never looked back. So this is how we'll spend our next 20 to 30-ish uh, minutes. Um, I will, for those of you who are not familiar with the search problem, uh, I'll give a very quick brief intro and then we'll give you an overview of the LinkedIn products, um, search and discovery products. Then we'll jump in um, to uh, kind of under the hood to see what powers these search and discovery experiences. And then at the end, I'll try to recruit you to work on search and discovery problems um, in your PM career. Sounds good? Cool. All right, um, so search is a computational problem, um, right, that requires finding a solution in some solution space, and that solution space can be infinite. Um, and of course, the act of searching means you're looking for something, you have some sort of a question. Whereas I think of the discovery problem as finding solutions, even though when you're, uh, even when you're not looking for them, all right? So you might not even know that they exist. Uh, can you guys see in the back actually? Okay, great. Um, kind of. <laughs> um, and then, uh, so um, I, th I kind of, I find it pretty cool that even, even in nature, right, um, there's, there's so many great examples of search um, and discovery, and um, especially natural selection and directed evolution is actually a really elegant search strategy. Um, right over the course of generations, it's trying to find a d DNA sequence that leads to organisms with maximum, ch uh, with the highest chances of survival. And on that note, um, I have like kind of there's a question: What is the universe searching for? Um, is it if it's searching for something or, or anything? Is it that long longevity, survival, right? Like life? Is it meaning or purpose or uh, love? Maybe um, or uh, truth? Right? It could be so many different things. Um, or maybe a better question is, what are you searching for? Um, and if uh, in a lot of our, a lot of us in the product management role, we're kind of obsessed about pro finding product market fit. So that could be one of the answers. Um, whatever it is that you're searching for, um, what um, kind of uh, what's in the core of it is really the concept of intent, um, which is a very important concept to understand in the world of search and discovery. And um, it can be quite complex. It has multiple dimensions, components to it, and depending on in your application and use case, you might want to think through certain like, key dimensions. I've listed a few of them here, things like the strength of intent, ranging from um, not at all to I have a very high intent, um, and also there's specificity. Um, do I know what, what I'm searching for, what my intent is, um, right? Or uh, am I looking for something very specific or kind of vague uh, or I don't know at all? Um, there's the effort, um, basically how much effort am I willing to put in to my process of searching? There is the control, how much control do I need? Things like uh, features like sorting and uh, filtering capabilities and that, that sort of thing. Um, the level of consideration, am I, um, am I just like sitting back, relaxing and open to serendipitously discovering or am I like leaning in right, and sifting through every result carefully uh, to find what I'm looking for? Um, so in this particular type of visualization, very high intent query based search. Um, uh, could be kind of somewhere in the outer kind of area, whereas more of a push product, like more of discovery products, uh, such as Newsfeed, would be more around the center, and then some sort of a browse product could be somewhere in between. Uh, but like I said, for your use case and application, um, you might need to look at other types of dimensions or a subset of these or superset. 
So another concept that's very important in the world of search is precision and recall. Um, one way to really internalize it, um, I found the really easy way is uh, through the statement of oath. Um, I'm searching for truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. All right, so, um, so we're searching for truth, the whole truth, not a part of it, uh, right? Like not half of it. So that's um, basically perfect recall. Uh, and I'm searching for nothing but the truth, uh, right? Like not some truth mixed in with the lies or fake truth and whatnot. And that's the concept of precision, right? So let's switch gears to LinkedIn. Um, LinkedIn is, of course, a professional network. Um, and our mission is to connect world's professionals to make them more productive and successful. Our overarching vision is to create opportunity um, for every member in the global workforce. And to do that, we've been building an economic graph, which is a digital representation of the world's economy. And that includes a digital profile for every member in the global workforce, um, for every company in the workforce, um, in, the, in the global economy, every job provided by those companies, every skill required to obtain those jobs, um, all of the schools, academic institutions, and we overlay on top of that the professional knowledge shared by our members, our um, companies, and schools and universities. Search product is, um, plays a really key role to make this graph really actionable and useful for our members. Because by searching the nodes and edges of the graph, we, uh, we can find uh, our members' dreams, dream jobs, right? Like they're, or connect them to the right people or to the right type of learning content and so on. Um, so in terms of search, um, what, and like given our company mission vision, what we really, chase and what we obsess about is this opportunity, right? So it's just really at the heart of everything that we do um, because we want to find the right people, the right jobs, the right, uh, right, like the right content uh, for our members. In terms of the users uh, on LinkedIn who use search um, products, we have consumers, folks such as yourselves who are trying to find uh, other people by names, for instance, or by other uh, criteria. Um, uh, and uh, consumers who are looking for jobs as well or for content. And then on the other hand, we have um, outbound professionals who use our products such as Recruiter and we have another product called Sales Navigator. Um, they, th these, um, th these folks use LinkedIn search as part of their daily job to find clients, prospects, and recruits and so on. Um, the intent, uh, as I mentioned, is very complex. It has multiple dimensions, but in, the, in our context, in the context, uh, context of LinkedIn, we kind of categorize it into two higher level categories, navigational and exploratory. Navigational being, um, I know what I want, I'm looking for it, there's one right answer, I'm trying to get to it as fast as I can. Uh, whereas exploratory is, I might have some idea of like what I'm looking for. I just want to explore and look around. Um, and then as I'm doing that, I might actually clarify my intent and like I, I might use some of the filtering capabilities, for instance, right? Like to sift through the results and so on. Um, we have multiple products um, from in the search land to help with those use, for, for the, uh, to help those users um, uh, and uh, those intents. Uh, we have the search home screen that you see on the left here, and that's a screen that you see once you tap on or uh, click on the search box. This is the initial screen, even before you type in your query. Um, so that's that screen. Here we give you entry paths, uh, entry points to explore the graph, uh, like if you want to explore people or jobs, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, also give you your, uh, show you your previous queries for recall, or if, uh, if you're one of those people who do, uh, does the same search over and over again throughout the day, sort of thing. And then on the right, you see a screen called type ahead. Uh, so that's a screen that you, uh, the results that you see once you start typing in your query, one character at a time, right? It's rendering the results, uh, it has instant search. Once you submit your query, um, uh, we, that, the experience uh, search results page, you see on the left, 
I have uh, my query here is Product Manager San Francisco. Since we have multiple entities in the economic graph and this query is actually quite ambiguous, I might be looking for people, might be looking for jobs, right? Like Product Manager jobs in San Francisco, I might be looking for content and so on. So we, we retrieve all the results from different verticals, which are these entities from our economic graph, um, and present them in the tabbed experience. Also, we have a top tab, which is kind of the aggregation of those um, from the, the, the most relevant verticals. We uh, fetch um, some top results. And then, of course, we have filters and uh, faceting capability. Uh, one thing I want to call out is this content search experience, post search um, experience that is that uh, is relatively new. Uh, we launched it last year, and that has multiple different content types that we have, like articles and videos and feed updates um, or um, like shares, right? Like that you, you you share on the feed, status updates, and so on. So we do kind of, uh, we aggregate those and show them um, here. And then on the right you see storylines, which is, which uh, we've uh, launched recently as well. What these are, these are news stories. Uh, for, uh, news stories about professional news happening in, the, in your industry. And this is actually a combination of editorial and algorithmic experience and that's been working um, pretty good, uh, really well for us. All right, so uh, now let's take a look under the hood um, and see what's actually powering um, these experiences. I uh, kind of think of this finding opportunity process as a three-step process. Um, one, we of course want to understand your underlying intent. Um, either we want to predict it uh, or like really want to understand it so that we can find the right answers for you and present them. And so that's step two. And then three, we don't want to stop there. We actually go, uh, want to go beyond and want to kind of inspire you, right, to explore for, further and discover further. So I'll go through these one by one. For the first one, as part of um, kind of predicting and understanding intent, um, even before you step, uh, start typing in your query, who you are actually gives us a good idea about, what, about your intent, underlying intent, and that actually helps us further down the road personalize the search results for you as well. To do that, we have a machine learning model um, that uh, is trained on, search on your profile um, data and uh, your previous searching behavior. And what we're trying to figure out is, are you a job seeker? Um, are you a content consumer, right? Or, or are you a recruiter looking for people? Um, and like I said, that helps us personalize the experience down the road. And then once you start typing in your query, we want to understand your intent. Um, and to do that, we have multiple different kind of uh, features, components. Um, spell check, we want to automatically correct your query as you're typing in. We have autocomplete suggestions as well to help you formulate your query. And uh, we have we do vertical suggestions also. Um, let's go through these one by one. For automatic spell correction, we do this both on, this, on the type ahead as you're typing in your query. Uh, we want to grace, gracefully recover and kind of predict, you know, like do spell checking. Um, and we do that on the search results page as well. On the first example here at the top, um, this is the example of automatic spell correction uh, in the autocomplete suggestion. Um, I'm trying to type in creative, uh, but I omitted A and uh, it recovered gracefully. The second one actually is the name. I'm trying to spell the name. I'm trying to find Marissa Mayer, but I omitted one of the S's um, there. But um, even uh, if I did that, it found the right Marissa Mayer for me. And then the, th the third one, I did a pretty horrible job of spelling deep learning, but it found it. So uh, it is another machine learning model. Uh, and for type of head use case, uh, it does uh, support the partial queries because it's more of a spell check as you type sort of a service. In terms of autocomplete, um, well, this actually is my favorite feature in search engines because it's a major time saver, all right? Um, so here, what we have is a, um, a machine learning model that's trained on um, query logs, and um, it basically it's based on like co-occurrence of entities in these queries that we we see we've seen in the past. 
Um, it's personalized as well. Um, so in this case, I've typed in product manager SA. We're trying to figure out what's the probability of San Francisco given product manager, what's the probability of SAS, for instance, given product manager, and so on, like how common these are, right, like in the past queries that we've seen. Um, let's see. And then uh, it is personalized. So for instance, if I would type in uh, MA, for instance, um, I might get an autocomplete suggestion for machine, but someone else might get an autocomplete suggestion for um, manager and so on. All right, and then once we present autocomplete suggestions, if the query is ambiguous, then we suggest verticals as well. So in this case, I'm trying, I'm going for machine learning. Machine learning is a pretty ambiguous query. We don't know if you're looking for people with machine learning, um, in the machine learning field, or are you looking for jobs that require machine learning skills? So we do suggest both people and jobs verticals on top of those autocomplete suggestions. Uh, another ML model, um, and it's trained on previous searches and um, actions. So then, um, as, uh, as we're trying to understand the intent, um, so uh, first of all, like, all of that was actually query assistance, uh, meaning we want to help you um, uh, help you enter the right query, right? So it's like a help us help in kind of a situation because if you put in junk, you will get junk out. So we were trying to really uh, help you formulate the right query, right? Like with uh, spell, uh, spell checking, with autocomplete suggestions, vertical suggestions, and so on. Um, he, then we actually want to kind of go further. We want to predict the intent behind your query. Um, so whether it's navigational or exploratory. In this example, uh, my query is software engineer, Google New York. The intent is most probably exploratory. I'm looking, I'm like looking through all the software engineers um, in Google New York. Uh, it could be actually navigational as well. Maybe I've just met someone who's a software engineer from Google and he's out in New York. I just don't remember their name, um, his name, and just like trying to find it this way as well, but most likely it's exploratory. And we try to predict the vertical here as well. Um, you might, maybe you're looking for people or maybe you're, look, you're looking for jobs. Then uh, what we do is query tagging, which is we take your query, chop it up into logical units, and try to recognize each unit against the, uh, with the entity that we have in our economic graph. Right, so software engineer is one unit, and that is a title. Um, it could be a skill as well. Um, Google is another unit, it's a company, and New York, of course, is a location, right? So we, what we do is we recognize these and we annotate the query, each unit, basically, with these, uh, with the entities, and submit that to the search engine. What that does is um, it really helps with precision. So how it works, um, we have an ML model here that's trained on uh, the user profiles um, to kind of build up the language model, and then um, also uh, trained on query logs and um, kind of manually curated dictionaries that we've accumulated over the years. These are the dictionaries of titles, standardized titles that we know of and all the company names. All right, and then, um, then the, our next step is actually to do query expansion. So here we want to increase recall by doing things like synonyms, uh, synonym expansions. Um, uh, an example, we do that for names for, uh, in the people search case and for uh, jobs, we do that with titles as well. Uh, so in the case of a name, for instance, um, I have typed in Jeffrey W. I'm actually trying to find Jeff Weiner, so it, but it, it found Jeff Weiner, right? Even though he doesn't spell his name with, uh, with Jeffrey, because we understand that Jeff and Jeffrey are synonymous, um, and we have these basically in our dictionaries. Um, and, um, and then, See, I am, and then in the jobs, like in the title case, um, similar situation, software engineer would be synonymous with software developer and so on. How we do that is we have machine learning models uh, that are trained in query reformulations. For instance, um, in the past, if I have typed in Jeffrey uh, Weiner, looked at the results, didn't find the person I was looking for, and then changed my query to Jeff Weiner, looked at the results and clicked, found one and clicked on it. So that's the type of data we train on. And then a slightly kind of 
um, a different variation of uh, name synonyms is name clustering, which is the uh, kind of alternative different spellings of the same names. For instance, Caitlin, there's multiple ver different ways to spell spell that right like with a c or with a k l-i-n l-y-n and so on um, so we have um, solutions for that as well all right so that was all about the query understanding the query the intent behind your query um, then we do ranking for ranking we have separate models for different verticals that we have we have different uh, people uh, ranking model we have jobs you know content model and so on we also have a separate model for type ahead because in the type ahead, um, as you're typing in your query, we need to be really fast, um, right? And we might, we, especially on mobile devices, we need to really uh, gracefully kind of recover from spelling errors or like fat fingering errors and that sort of thing. Um, so we, like the feature set that we use in the machine learning models for type ahead are actually uh, quite small because we, uh, we don't have the luxury of time. Whereas on this actual search results pages, we have the luxury of time so we can uh, kind of uh, consider the vast uh, number of features that we have available. Um, it is a machine learned model. It's, um, it's personalized, so it is the function of the query and the user. Um, I remember, initial, like uh, I said, like who you are actually helps us uh, with figuring out what kind of results we should show you uh, that we think you might find relevant. And then some of the, for people search use case, uh, for ranking, some of the features, common features that we have are network distance, how closely are you connected to the person you are looking for, um, the connection strength, how many people, for instance, that you have in common, or do you have your school in common or company in common, that sort of thing. Um, global popularity, even without the kind of consideration of your network, um, like your global popularity plays a role as well. In that a case that I've shown you with Marissa Mayer, um, since she's like globally popular, even though I'm not connected to her, she's out of my network, that showed up uh, as a first result in that, in that example. And then of course, spamminess. Um, we want to demote people who spam their titles with like every skill they have or the, every company they look, work at, so don't do that. Um, in the content search case, some of the common features are freshness, right, like how fresh the content is, especially for exploratory content uh, search experience. If I'm searching for machine learning, um, I, we want to give you more of kind of fresh results. And then uh, whether the author of the content, uh, the article or, you know, feed share and so on is in your network or not, um, a lot of the times that actually matters. And um, engagement signals like number of likes, number of comments, number of shares, that sort of thing. And then in this specific storyline um, case, as I mentioned, it's a hybrid editorial and uh, algorithmic uh, solution. So we look at the editor tags. So editors basically seed the storylines with few content pieces that they have found that they think are very relevant to build the storylines for us. All right, and then um, blending is a, a solution we have in a couple of, in few different experiences. One of the examples is a top SERP. Like I mentioned earlier, we have multiple verticals, um, results from multiple verticals. We want to retrieve the top ones from the most relevant verticals and like blend them and show them to you. Um, in, in a lot of cases, this is kind of actually like less blending, more like swirling kind of a thing. Um, but uh, the same thing on the type of head experience as well. Um, in this case, I am typing in design. Um, we show you company results that have the design in them. Uh, we show you schools, groups, and so on. Um, let's see. So then, yeah, so that was ranking and blending. Um, the third step um, in our overall process was just overall kind of help you discover, right? Like explore further. Some examples here are just we're showing you common connections, even though you haven't asked, like in the people search result, even though you haven't asked for it. So like as a next step, you might want to kind of continue exploring like that. Uh, or in the content search experience, uh, my, con my query is Bitcoin. Uh, the first result here is, the, uh, is an article by Fast Company, and we know the topic um, of this article, and we show you other uh, related topics, so you can jump in, so like cryptography, computing, and so on in the tags there, so you can just kind of keep exploring. Cool, um, all right, so hopefully that gives you a kind of a good idea of how 
we uh, build um, search and discovery products on LinkedIn. Um, next, I would, uh, if you haven't worked on search problems before, um, I think you should, and here are some reasons. Overall, I think uh, search and discovery is actually one of the very few products uh, where, you, um, where you get to kind of think very big picture and like high level as you're kind of thinking through, like holistically thinking through all the, um, all the documents or things or like products that you need to make like searchable and discoverable, right, like in your company. Um, and, uh, but at the same time, you kind of think uh, all the way down to minute details, like super tiny details as well, like in the example of that type of HUD experience, right? Like as I'm typing one character at a time, we obsess about, oh, I just typed in J, how come my result is not looking good? Then I typed in another character, right? Like, uh, is the result looking good? Like, how should we, uh, how the U UX should work and so on. Um, so it's just all of, uh, it's just, the whole spectrum really like the big picture to like to the tiny details and I find that you actually really exercise your systems thinking muscle a lot as well because you're kind of holistically taking a look at every organization in your company and like see how they relate kind of uh, trying to find um, uh, commonalities between seemingly unrelated things. Uh, in terms of the UX it's actually um, pretty it's pretty um, hard to design uh, with static mocks. Oftentimes you have to do a lot of prototyping to get really to get the feeling of it and to really kind of train your intuition and so on. So I find it pretty fascinating from that perspective as well. Of course you're dealing with a shit ton of data, all right? There's like a lot of metrics that you're looking at on a daily basis, trying to find insights and kind of uh, causations, correlations, and so on, and you're doing a lot of mental gymnastics to get the, to get to those insights. From pure product management perspective, uh, from product building perspective, it really has all of the components. It has um, the UX part, it has the relevance, like algorithmic machine learning uh, part, um, it has the platform itself, the uh, infrastructure, the search index, and it has like analytics pieces and so on. So you get exposure to all of these different areas. Um, search actually was the biggest, the first um, big data application on the web, right? And um, it started uh, like kind of employing uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning early on. So you learn a ton about that area. Um, and as I mentioned, very uh, in the beginning as well, there is so many. There are many examples of search in nature as well. So you really learn about biological intelligence too. Cool. Um, in terms of how we measure success, there's, uh, as I mentioned, there are so many different uh, metrics um, that we keep track of, implicit, explicit, there's like true north, like what is actually, what do we find, uh, what do we uh, define as success? It's definitely not that binary thing. Um, there's whole levels of it, um, it, it, like whether it's like successful sessions, search sessions, or like sessions, success rate of the session, um, uh, whether like downstream metric impact, right? Like did people end up starting conversations with each other? Did they connect to each other, um, right? Like that or sharing the content and uh, so on and so forth. Um, there's a lot of uh, quantitative aspects, qualitative as well. We do a whole lot of UER and, um, and uh, kind of user feedback sessions and that sort of thing from qualitative as, uh, aspects as well. Um, there's a lot of engagement metrics, right, like conversion metrics. Um, so it's just basically across the whole spectrum. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. Cool, I think that's all I got for now. Any questions? Yes. SEO strategy for LinkedIn. Uh, what specifically? Like how can I increase my exposure, like personal profile, or like how can we can increase the exposure for the hiring? Like, is there any tactic or anything? Hmm. Uh, so SEO like basically is very separate, right, from the internal search and discovery products that we do. Um, so we do have uh, overall strategies for, depending on if you are talking about your own profile, or um, your kind of, if you're a company uh, page owner, right? You have your own company um, and like SEO strategies for that, for instance, and so on. 
Um, so, but it's very, very kind of separate from the search products that we have, though. So this is possible. Maybe we can put some very hot trend keywords in our profile, so we can increase our exposure. Mm -hmm. Or can we make like uh, maybe our link profile link can be referred by other website, so it can also increase our exposure. Is there I see, I see. Interesting. That's a great question. I actually don't know if we do publish or kind of advice on uh, SEO strategies, but we can chat offline. Uh, I just, I, I'm not sure. It's a great question. Yeah? In the first, one of the first graphs you had where it showed, shows um, kind of like serendipitous or like mm -hmm. details, there was a circle and then two smaller circles inside mm -hmm. of it. What are the two smaller circles? Yeah, so that is just basically, well, I can't go back to it, but, uh, you know, like as um, kind of, it was different dimensions, as you go to the outer kind of edges, um, it's more, gets more and more specific, right? So the bigger kind of circle is really your high intent search, like more of the outer edge, whereas like as you go in, it's like more of discovery, gets getting into kind of more typical discovery products. So the, the smallest circle in the center was more of like a feed product, which is like all push and that sort of thing. Um, and the middle one was, I was thinking it's more like a browse, for instance, like you start with some idea, but you're still kind of open to exploring, um, that sort of thing. And the big one was like? It's search. search, yeah. So that's the most specific. Mm -hmm. Is there something more specific with uh, something so there's different variations of search too right so like whether in the search um, you spe you have your query if we're kind of if, if our definition of search is it's a query based, based search um, you can specify additional parameters like filters for instance right like and sort order and all of that kind of stuff so you can get like more and more specific as well and then if you've specified a vertical like I'm you're only focusing on people for instance and that sort of thing Yeah, oh, yes, thank you. The other thing you. is, uh, for the audience, if you have questions, uh, go on bio.com, hashtag product SF is how you get in, and feel free to like the questions that you feel like uh, are good, that you wanted to answer. Uh, and also, uh, for Shazina, uh, can you repeat the questions? Sure, for, uh, sounds good. Okay, cool, let's take the first question. Can you share an example of a B test of a new feature and what kind of success metrics related to it? Um, great question. So as I mentioned, uh, new, one of the new features was um, the content search experience. Um, before uh, sometime, I think we launched it sometime last year, um, before that we didn't have um, the ability to search the vast uh, kind of uh, amount of content that we had on LinkedIn, whether it's articles or um, the uh, status updates and shares and so on. So when we did that, we, uh, of course, gradually ramped it. Um, some of the metrics, like we, we ramped it and A-B tested it. Some of the metrics that we weren't looking at before um, that came from content search were, for instance, uh, for, um, especially for exploratory content search experience was time spent. Um, so, as you, if you if you search for machine learning and like you're looking through the um, the results, um, how much time are you spending? Time spent can be a very tricky thing, um, right? So, like if you're actually wanting to, like if you're spending a whole lot of time, that might mean that you're kind of lost. You you're, you can't find what you're looking for, or it could be a really good thing if you're actually really engaged with the content and uh, exploring. Um, other metrics like number of likes and uh, comments, um, number of shares. Um, and really the scrolls, for instance, as well, that can be some measure um, uh, as well. And then all the typical metrics um, that we already tracked uh, for search. Does that answer the question? Any? Cool. Uh, let's move to the next one. Do any of your colleagues have non-engineering backgrounds? If not, what are the most critical systems or languages you work with daily? Uh, do any, I'm assuming my colleagues in terms of product managers. Um, so they, let, let me think. My, my when I, so I think all of the product managers have in the search team currently have, um, are coming from engineering backgrounds. But um, that said, in previous companies I've worked at where I've worked on search, 
Um, I've seen very successful product managers who did not come from engineering backgrounds as well. So coming from like purely business backgrounds or even philosophy, for instance, and um, that did not stop them. Um, and so really they, they became successful as well. So it really, I think it, it's not really about what you studied in school. I think it's just your overall curiosity and what you're kind of continuously learning and um, that sort of thing. Um, and then the, what was the, the next part of that question? I think like what languages, yeah. Um, So we, uh, so we, in terms of like languages, we use Java um, a lot, and um, in terms of our search platform itself, we have uh, our own platform called Galene, and it's um, it's built on top of the open source Lucene search stack. So um, from the kind of platform infrastructure level, uh, we use that. Uh, any questions from the audience? Mm -hmm. How does a PM uh, add value to that? It seems like a very technical uh, <coughs> aspect of the product, and how as a PM do you add value uh, to that portion? Great question. So the question was, significant portion of uh, my talk was highlighting uh, machine learning and algorithmic aspects, and the question is, how does a PM add value there? Uh, well, there are different uh, um, different components to a search product, right? Like I've highlighted more of like machine learning kind of part. There's definitely a heavy UX component there as well, and uh, overall kind of platform uh, index part. Um, there's um, you know, it's it's a very analytical product for sure. So you, you exercise that muscle, and. Um, at LinkedIn, all of us actually work through all of these different components. So everyone touches relevance, works with the relevance engineers and with the UX and designers and so on. Um, um, because it just worked out that their backgrounds and interests lie there. Um, whereas in different companies I've worked, are, I've, I've worked at in the past, uh, for instance at eBay, uh, some search product managers focused solely on uh, UX part and some solely on relevance part and that sort of thing. The value added by product managers is just really across at LinkedIn especially. Um, so we think about the problems that we need to solve um, and um, then go from there and uh, see if it uh, maybe the solution only requires the UX uh, part, like there, there's only design that needs to get tweaked or maybe it just uh, touches all of these other components as well. So uh, depending on that, we work with different, you know, different types of teams. The uh, question is, how decisions are made, combining different features together and different functions together, such as engineering, product management, and design. Um, features themselves, it's really, especially for uh, newer projects, um, we start with like brainstorming um, with the whole team, with uh, engineers, with product managers, designers, uh, data scientists, and so on. And, f and figure out what are the different features, features that we need to use in our machine learning model um, because good ideas come from everywhere, right? It's not just an, a machine learning engineer's job to figure out the features. Um, in terms of the um, who, like different functions at the, at the, so like your question is around like what's the contribution from different functions or? Um, more specifically, how decisions are made. How decisions are made. Um, so the decisions uh, made from the process, so it is a collaboration for sure. Depends, depends on the feature that we're launching as well. For instance, if it's a minor tweak, let's say to a type of head model, um, I just work as a product manager, work with a relevance engineer, and that doesn't touch any of the design, for instance, or like UX um, you know, area. So it, it just can be a contained kind of conversation like that, and we go ahead and decide and um, ramp in, uh, you know, start an A-B test and see how it's performing. So it's very a lot of data-driven decision-making, especially at LinkedIn, uh, especially with search products, uh, just the nature of that. Um, uh, but then higher level 
UX decisions is actually a, a collaboration with product manager, product managers, designers, engineers, like relevance engineers, and just overall UI engineers and data scientists, um, right? Like everyone in, in the room. Um, some things are more qualitative than quantitative. Some things are kind of, we can test easily. Some things are just more of design direction that we want to take. And we do more qualitative studies there. So um, it's really different depending on the solution. How much did base, I'm just piggybacking off that question, how much do you um, base uh, the decisions on like user feedback or like user basically? Mm -hmm. how, much of, how much of the decisions are based on user feedback? Um, a lot, well, a lot of it actually. So we do, um, when we are first ramping a new feature, uh, we do quite a, quite a lot of dog footing. So we, uh, we um, ramp it to initially to the team only and then to the company. And everyone basically submits feedback, right? Saying, hey, like, you, 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 like what changed here? I can't find what I, was, what I was able to find anymore, sort of things. It's really easy mechanisms, mechanism for us to gather feedback. Um, and then we start, if everything is looking good, we start ramping to public um, gradually. Um, and we start, uh, if something is really broken, uh, we definitely hear it from customer support. And we closely monitor that. And uh, definitely we pay closer, uh, close attention to those issues and fix those. A lot of uh, the other things um, with search, like you might not want to, as a user of the search product, might not want to report every small thing, kind of nuance or like something that um, really kind of annoys you, right? For those usually show up in our metrics. So we, uh, yeah, we look at metrics a lot. Let me go back to uh, Slido. Are the taxonomies you use homegrown or third party? Taxonomies in terms of, so we have taxonomies of standardized uh, titles, like job titles, for instance, and uh, skills have taxonomies. All of that is, uh, are, uh, is uh, homegrown we, that we have accumulated over the years. Uh, we um, employ several taxonomists who are constantly looking at the kind of uh, quality of data and standardizing, understanding what is in the DNA of a skill, for instance, um, that sort of thing. So, um, so all of that is just internal. Um, how are you measuring success of your product? All right, uh, so there's so many different uh, kind of variables, different metrics that we track. The true north of it is, from quantitative side, is um, our success rate of our searches, search sessions, how successful we have been finding uh, what you were looking for. Um, it's a quite complex metric, and we're constantly evolving it. Um, other kind of similar one to it is the successful number of overall successful search sessions. Um, and of course that gives us the um, kind of uh, the, how many, like the unique users part as well, how many people are using uh, our product and if that's growing or not. Um, and then like depending on the specific feature, for instance, for type ahead, the success of it is click through race on type ahead, for instance, right? Um, another thing we track, especially for navigational intent is time it took for you to click on the first result. So once you submit your query or as you're typing in your query, how long it took you to get to the first result. Um, so that's another one. Um, and then, um, let's see. On qualitative perspective, uh, like I said, we do a lot of user, user testing. Um, in typ typically in search systems, um, they do a lot of human judgment, a lot of crowdsourced human judgments. Basically, you employ like services like Crowdflower and uh, ask the human judges to kind of grade your search product for you uh, for different queries that you give them. In our case, it's actually pretty hard um, because um, it's very subjective. Relevance is very subjective for us because we're a network. So your network, your relationships actually play a key role and also who you are as well, whether you are a recruiter or a job seeker or a content um, you know, consumer, for instance, um, really uh, dictates what you find relevant, and especially for more like ambiguous queries. So it's hard for us to gather human judgment 
uh, human labeled data. So instead, what we use was uh, is the click logs. Um, so from that perspective, we don't like in, in typical search systems you do use human judgment. Uh, we don't really, although we do use human judgment for like WTF results. Like we show our judges um, the you know queries and then the responses, the results that we have, and they can say, oh, like this is a completely irrelevant result instead of saying what's the most relevant because that's subjective. Do you have a hard definition of what is a successful search session? Uh, we do. It's constantly, so uh, the question is what's a hard definition of successful search session? Um, it is evolving as we, like uh, currently as well. Um, a very kind of high level definition of it is uh, overall our search sessions are bounded by um, the, you're clicking on the search box. So once you tap on your search box, that starts your search section until, uh, search session until you uh, do that again. Um, and then within that, what's successful is the kind of easiest measure of success is a click. Uh, so like if you t uh, clicked on a search result, that's success. Although it's tricky because you can click on a result and actually get back to it because it, you thought it was relevant, but it really wasn't, right? That sort of thing. Um, uh, so we do kind of under try to understand what's your dwell time um, in, the, uh, in the destination and that sort of thing. Question. Uh, there are general differences between mobile and desktop version. What are the aspects uh, you look at to decide which features should be included in the mobile version? Uh, what are the differences um, between the desktop and mobile uh, versions of search products? On mobile, we are, um, it's, one thing is the actual usage of the product is different. Uh, people are uh, intent. Uh, uh, people tend to uh, have more of navigational intent on mobile because you're just you met someone, you're quickly trying to find their uh, profile, sort of a thing. Um, and recruiters, for instance, who do a lot of you know exploratory researches, they don't do that on mobile, right? Like they want their you know during the day they use desktop. So from that perspective, even the intent types of intent we see, types of users we see are different. Uh, so we optimize for those. Um, in, uh, and then UX, of course, like we're uh, working with a small screen on mobile, so you know, just overall, like we're optimizing for that. Whereas on desktop, we have a bigger real estate, so we can show you additional kind of snippets, um, additional kind of results, um, kind of, uh, or um, additional information on search results. So those are some of the criteria. Uh, let me go back to Slido. How do you manage personalization of MM plus users? Millions, I'm assuming. Um, so how do we use, how do we do personalization? Um, so for us, um, personalization uh, is a key because your identity and your relationships uh, matter a whole lot, right? Your identity in terms of who you are. Um, who you can uh, and like where you work at a lot um, and your previous uh, searching behavior relationships in terms of the network itself who you're connected to and all of that uh, so how do we do that at scale um, really we have machine learning models um, be, uh, that are trained uh, right like because it's just really hard to do it with rules-based solutions so we train models um, on personalized features uh, as I mentioned, in different type of, type of product components that we have, we're looking at people's query formulations, we're looking at their past search, searching behavior, we're looking at their kind of trying to model the, who they are, um, what their searcher intent, um, so on and so forth. Question from the audience? Yes. So, uh, two part question. One is, uh, since you're already so far ahead with your search algorithm, uh, what kind of uses are you working on right now? And the second part of that is, uh, do you go through a, a cost versus revenue kind of analysis for these use cases, or because you, you, you keep the user experience as the most important thing, and then whatever cost it takes, you guys kind of just do it? Great question. So the question is, um, what, uh, what um, so the second one was the cost. So overall, kind of how, since we have a very established product, how do we, uh, I don't, what is it? Okay, okay, well, basically use cases. Okay, so what are these cases and then how do we um, decide on them? Um, so it is, um, it, it's a combination of things. It depends on what the focus is from business perspective. 
um, at any given time as well. Um, and of course, what are the gaps in our current offering? Uh, what we want to do and looking at the industry where the search technology, uh, the search uh, in general product is evolving, more, especially moving more into the discovery space, for instance, um, and the technology itself, right? Like what, what are the different capabilities that we can use, um, especially, for instance, getting into like deep learning space and that sort of thing. So it's really the combination and um, we do our quarterly planning and we figure out, okay, what is the problem that we want to solve? Um, um, for that quarter. And uh, some of the use cases the team is uh, working on currently are um, the things like kind of guidance. Uh, how can we guide you through your exploration, um, right? Especially if you don't have a clear kind of um, question in mind, you want to start somewhere. And then as you go through, how can we guide you like really to explore? the graph um, and uh, get meaningful information out of it. Um, some are, let's see, what else are we working on? The storyline um, uh, kind of area, there's a lot of um, new, new kind of uh, use cases, new features that we have as well, um, especially around uh, the topics, basically topical feeds. Uh, based on your interests. So machine learning is, uh, you know, might be your interest, for instance, or product management. How can we um, kind of really show you all the conversations happening around it, all the content, the, the rich like knowledge base that we have um, for that topic, and how can we kind of um, like serve you the fresh content, right, like meaningful content and that sort of thing so that you would come back to it over and over again.